start off the class with a very quick review. And the reason I do this review all the way back to the first of Paul's journeys is because I, I, I want it to kind of become by rote for you. I want it to be something that you kind of have in that mental map of your mind. So Paul's first journey is with Barnabas, and they uh, take this uh, uh, circular route um, uh, down through Cyprus and then back up. Um, over to Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and Derby, and then back again. So they, they kind of make a clockwise loop that then once they get to Derby, they'll counterclockwise all the way back. Um, after that, uh, they split at, uh, and separate uh, on the second journey. Uh, Paul going over the top uh, past those areas like Derby and Lystra and whatnot, and uh, Barnabas taking John Mark who the, was the one that was the debate over. And that's why they separate. Paul takes Silas. Um, from there, we look at what is often referred to as Paul's second journey, which is with Silas. Silas is the one who leaves with him on that, as opposed to Barnabas. Uh, they travel through the known areas, but they also go up into the region of Galatia and Phrygia. And uh, from there, uh, Paul gets far enough... Uh, far enough west that he plans to go down to Asia, and he's not able to go there. He plans to go up to Bithynia, and he's not allowed to go up there. And so he finds himself uh, at the crossroads of Europe and Asia and the city of Troas. And it's in that location that he has the Macedonian vision, and uh, a, a man of uh, Macedon, uh, Macedonia is uh, crawling and, and saying, please help us. And so he heads over, and that's where he heads to Philippi. And this is where we start having to kind of track some details of the people that Paul has having travel with him, because he has Paul. Paul has Silas with him. He has Timothy with him. He has Luke with him, uh, potentially others, but those are the ones that we know. And uh, so he leaves Luke behind in Philippi. Uh, he leaves Timothy behind in Thessalonica uh, after only being able to be there for a few weeks. And then he goes down to Berea. Well, the People in Berea, they are very noble-minded, but the, the jealous Jews of Thessalonica come down to Berea and drive Paul out of that city too. And so Silas stays behind in Berea. So you have uh, Luke in Philippi, Timothy in Thessalonica, and Silas in Berea. And Paul takes a boat to Athens. And so they send him away by sea, Paul being alone for really the first time that we ever see in these journeys. So uh, he goes down to Athens, cannot keep his mouth shut because he is provoked by all the idolatry, uh, preaches there. Not a whole lot of conversion, though, to be honest with you. Even though it's a big city, not really one that takes the, the gospel. And so uh, Paul will leave there and head over to Corinth. In the city of Corinth, there is a great deal of tension that happens, a lot of difficult things uh, because... Paul is preaching in the synagogue, and then eventually he gets driven out of the synagogue, but he goes and stays with a guy who lives next door to the synagogue. So you can kind of imagine that tension. It's like, well, we hate this guy. Get out. And so he goes, sure, I'll be right over there, you know, 15 yards away. And so they don't like that. And then on top of it, one of the conversions is the leader of the synagogue, Crispus. So that adds a little bit of tension too. And so Paul is very fearful. And I, I imagine. Part of it, uh, of that fear, is Paul knows exactly how bad it can get. What's the worst that Paul ever faced in his journeys up to this point? Stoned and left for dead, right? We talk about it, Paul lived it. So he knows exactly how bad it can be. And so uh, there is a um, great concern there, uh, and yet he's told there are many people in the city keep preaching, and he does. But it's during that time in Corinth that Timothy comes back. And when T Timothy arrives, Paul will write the first Thessalonian letter. Right, This is a letter to the Christians there in Thessalonica. And then Timothy delivers it. Timothy will go up there with it, do some more preaching and teaching, come back. Paul will then write the second Thessalonian letter after that update. And so that's how fast email worked back then. Right? That's the process. Is, is he's waiting for Timothy. Timothy comes down and says, hey, this is, they're, they're doing well. They faced a lot of persecution. And Paul will talk a lot about that in the first letter, especially that he's impressed with their 
uh, endurance through affliction, um, but they also have a variety of questions and problems. One of those being when Paul had preached that we need to be prepared for the hope that Jesus will return. They're like, well, like noon tomorrow? Why don't we just all quit our jobs? Let's just focus on waiting for Jesus to come back, and, and that'll be great, right? Well, it's not a good idea, and Paul will have to address that in uh, First and Second Thessalonians, that no, when we, when we say waiting for Jesus to come back, that doesn't mean tomorrow. In fact, there's a lot of different things that have to happen before Jesus will return, and, and so that's uh, addressed in those letters. So they have some clear problems. Um, there are sexual immorality things that he addresses in there, but considering the fact that you can uh, measure the age of that congregation in weeks and months, it's pretty impressive that they have survived considering everything. And so Paul has very upbeat letters uh, when he writes to them, even though there's some you know, fairly big, uh, big ticket items he has to address. Okay, so this then brings us back to Corinth. So Acts 18, that's where we left off. Paul is in Corinth, and in Acts chapter 18, probably would help if I had that verse open myself. Um, Bible studies work best with Bibles, pro tip. Um, and so in, start in verse 11, uh, and now back up, back up, verse 9. So Paul has faced all of these things. There's been that conversion of Christmas. He's next door to the synagogue, and, and it says, The Lord said to Paul in the night by vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in the city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. This will be one of the longest stays that Paul has in any location, a year and a half. Interesting to me is the fact that Paul, he says, says to Paul, the, the Lord tells him, go on speaking, do not be silent. What does that tell you that Paul was tempted to do? Stop talking, be silent, right? It's a... We ha when you look at the resume of Paul, let me put it that way. When you look at Paul's resume and you look at all the things that he does and you look at how impressive his life is, it's easy to paint a picture of him being this like solid rock of a man who never had any fears, never had any terrors, just like put on his helmet and went for it. But the reality is much more real. Paul was an authentic Christian knew what it was like to suffer, and he had times where he had worries and fears and everything just like everybody else. And I think, for me, when I read Paul saying to Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a power and love and discipline, there's a whole new take when you realize that when he's telling Timothy to not be timid, but have power and love and discipline in the way that he approaches preaching, that that was a battle that Paul wrestled with too. It's not Paul saying, look, you weakling, be like me. I've always been fine. It's like, no, I know what it's like to feel timid sometimes. I know what it's like to struggle with that and not wanting to say anything to people. And the Lord told me to keep going, and I'm telling you to keep going. And so um, there's, a, there's a context uh, to, to the character and the life of this man who, who did so very much to shape uh, the preaching of the gospel to... Oh, well, frankly, to us, we're Gentiles. Uh, so verse 12, but while Gallio was uh, proconsul of Achaia, Achaia is the region that Corinth is in, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat. Now, you think about this, this is very similar to the sort of things that Paul faced in other places, including places where he got stoned. So he's brought before the judgment seat, and I might add, that's it. That's, those are the ruins of the Corinthian judgment seat. We know exactly where this is, which is kind of cool, right? You could, you could go to those ruins. You could say, this is where all of this stuff happened. And, um, and uh, they say, this man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Now, if, if you look at this, Gallio is a Roman official, right? He's the proconsul of Achaia, which is a, a Roman territory. He is not a Jew, and so when they say he persuades men to worship God contrary to the law, what law are they talking about? Yeah, they're talking about the law of Moses, 
but they're trying to get a Roman guy to do something. And has that ever worked? There is a case. There's a big case. You probably heard about it. It led to a crucifixion, right? That's, that was what happened with Jesus, right? They were mad at Jesus over his law, and they took him to Pilate, who's a Roman who had a right to crucify, and they said, let's, let's have, get rid of this guy for us. He broke our law, and it worked. Pilate crumbled. But here, you have something different. David, did you have something? No, nope. okay. Um, and so, verse 14, when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words and names and your own law, look after it yourselves. I'm unwilling to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. And they all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue. This is the new leader, right? Because what happened to the last leader? He converted. He's a Christian now. So this is the new guy. Right? Just newly elected to office. He's now got this job, and job number one is get rid of this Paul guy. And he doesn't do it, so they took Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. This is humorous to me. I mean, not everything in the Bible is meant to be humorous, and maybe it says something bad about me that I think it's funny. A guy got beaten. Um, but this whole thing turned absolutely upside down of what they expected. Right? They're looking for another pilot circumstance. We'll get the Romans to leverage for us, and then we'll, we'll get things to work out. And instead, it doesn't, and the Jews don't know what to do. So right there in front of that judgment seat, they decide to deal with it according to their own law. Right? That's what Galileo said. You're like, look, you deal with it yourself. So how do they deal with it themselves? They take Sosthenes, and they beat him right then and there. Like, you didn't fix this, and we don't like you. And, and so you can tell this is an entirely emotional thing, right? Uh, it says, but Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. So this is a fulfillment of what we have seen uh, regarding uh, the promises that God made to Paul. He told Paul, look, I have many people in this city. Don't be afraid. Keep speaking. So Paul keeps speaking. And then things get really ugly. They drag him before the judgment seat. And Paul's already, I have to give my defense again. And what does he have to say? Well, he would have had to said, say that potentially, right? But what does he actually say here? What, what's, tell me the words of Paul's speech. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have to say anything. He gets cut off. Gilly goes, I don't, I don't even want to hear your side. I've already decided. This is not my problem. Get out of here. And so Paul uh, ends up having a lot of freedom uh, there in that particular uh, area. Um, okay. Uh, so um, uh, uh, other uh, things that are interesting in, in regards to uh, um, uh, some things that, that come out of Corinth. Um, in Romans 16, verse 17, it talks about this guy named Erastus, the treasurer of the city. And uh, in the Corinthian ru ruins, they have that. So that's just kind of another interesting. I like when you can find these things. The Bible refers to them. And then you go to the archaeology and they dig. And they find that the archaeology doesn't at all match the biblical account. Or it's always the opposite, right? That's the problem. Like, they're always telling you, this isn't real history. What the Bible says isn't real history, but it is. These things are, are real. Um, okay, so Paul then is in Corinth for a year and a half. And then in verse 18, it says, Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. Um, and when Paul leaves for uh, Syria, um, let's see here. Um, uh, uh, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila, and then in verse, uh, and in Sancria had his hair cut for he was keeping a vow, and verse 19, they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. So here's Paul, he's on his way to Syria. Now where is Syria on this map? What city on this map is in Syria? Antioch. We got all the way over to the east, right? So he's, he's headed all the way over to Syria, but he stops in Ephesus and leaves Priscilla and Aquila behind there. And um, 
when they asked him, verse 20, when they, the, the um, people of Ephesus, asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent, but taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God will, wills, and he set sail from Ephesus. Now, this is the second time that Paul, on this journey, has not spent any time in Asia. If you remember, the first time he wanted to go to Asia, and he couldn't because the Lord said no. He was prevented. You're not allowed to go. This time, he comes to Ephesus, which is in Asia there, and he says, I don't have time. I'm trying to get back. So twice he's going to bypass the city of Ephesus. The reason that this is interesting is when he eventually gets there, amazing things will happen. But there are twice that it just like, man, I just can't seem to ever get there. Uh, and uh, and uh, again, this is just part of that. You see God's plan. You ever have something you really wanted to do and it just never seems to work out? And then when it does work out, you look back and you go, oh, that timing was so much better than what timing I would have had. That's what's going to be with Paul with emphasis. So he leaves uh, Priscilla and Aquila behind there. Acts 18 uh, will describe that while Priscilla and Aquila are left behind there, they end up being involved in the conversion of a man named Apollos. And Apollos will travel from Ephesus all the way over to Corinth. And he'll do some preaching there, which is why when you read in the first Corinthian letter, the church is all divided up. And Paul addresses that because some people are saying, I'm of Jesus. And some people are saying, I'm of Paul. And some people are saying, I'm of Apollos. That's how Apollo shows up in the scene. He's converted by Priscilla and Aquila there in Ephesus and then ends up traveling over uh, to Corinth. Okay. Um, now... Uh, let's see here. Um, anything else before I finish that up? Paul will eventually end up uh, going from there. Verse 22, when he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church, and then he went down to Antioch. So this ends Paul's second journey, the one that he took with, uh, with Silas, uh, amongst others. And that, uh, that fulfills that circuit. Because he starts in Antioch, and where's the end? Right back at Antioch, right? So it's a big loop that Paul makes from the congregation that sent him out, returning to that same congregation at the very end. Really, when you think about it, that's not any different than when we send preachers out, right? We support guys, and what do they often do? Eventually, they come back and tell us how things are going. And that's, that's what happens with, with Paul as well. Anybody have any questions or thoughts or anything there on that second journey? Okay, so in the second journey, two books are written, First and Second Thessalonians. Buckle up, it gets more. Uh, third journey, we get a lot. This journey will be one that Paul will begin uh, in starting in verse 23. Now, if you look at this, look in Acts 18, verse 23. Having spent some time there, that is in Antioch, back with that congregation there, he left and passed successively through the Galatian region and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So what we're seeing him do is travel right up through the same territory that he traveled through on the first two journeys. Now, the first one, he went with Barnabas and, and ended up in that area. The second journey, he ends up going to Galatia and Phrygia and including them in it. Uh, and in his Galatian letter, he says, I first visited you because of a physical ailment. So now on this third journey, he's going to go there. Now I have up on the slides 1 Corinthians 16. Because what we're doing is we're piecing together Paul's life and what's going on. So in verse 23, it just says, look, after being in Antioch, he travels through the Galatian and Phrygian regions and goes back through those churches, strengthening them. But in 1 Corinthians 16, he tells them in his letter to them, concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. What Paul is going to do is he's going to be telling these congregations, look, there is, there is a bad time coming, and it's going to deeply impact the lives of Christians, especially impoverished Christians, as we have a famine coming. And so, 
that group of Christians that are most impoverished in all the world are the Christians that are in and around Israel. That is a poorer region of the world than places like Iconium or Philippi or Corinth or Galatia. And so Paul is going to do something that no Jew would ever imagine doing. He's going to go to a bunch of Gentiles and ask them to raise money to take care of a bunch of Jews. Pre-Christianity, no way this happens for two reasons. One, the Gentiles aren't going to raise the money. We're not giving any money to those guys. And two, even if they had raised the money, what happens if a Gentile says, hey, I got a bunch of money to give you Jews to help you out? What are they going to do? I don't want your money, you dirty, unclean, good for nothings, right? So there's this cultural rift. Paul is doing something pretty amazing. Through guidance of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit's the one guiding Paul in how the collection should happen and all these sorts of things, he's unifying Christians. Because there are Christians in need, and there are Christians who have extra to offer, and there's this cultural difference. But in Jesus, how much does Jesus care about that cultural difference? Not one whit. In Christ, we're all one body. And so Paul is telling these congregations, take up this collection, and then if you look in 1 Corinthians 16, move over there with me real quick. I want to pay attention to a couple of other details there. So, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. So that tells you, I've been starting in Galatia, and as I've been going to congregations, I'm telling every church to take up collections the same way. On the first day of the week, right, this is our pattern. If we need to take up a collection, when do we do it? First day of the week, because do you have any other pattern of when we should take up a collection in your Bible? Any other, any other example? If you had another example, we could use that, right? But if we have to take up a collection, and we're like, well, how does the church collect money to do the work that the church is supposed to do? We only have one example. And the only example we have is found here in 1 Corinthians 16. They did it on the first day of the week. So you take it up, and uh, people are setting aside and saving as they prospered. And then he says, so no collections be made when I come. So here is further proof. Can a congregation raise a sum of money and like put it in a bank account or something. What they were doing, if you look at 1 Corinthians 16, you, you, you put aside and then we don't want any collections happening when Paul shows up. The collection's already been done, right? We don't, Paul doesn't show up and we all start grabbing our billfolds going, uh, hey, you have any more money in the, in the car? Uh, maybe, maybe something in the couch cushions? None of that's happening, right? It's all done ahead of time. But then he says in 1 Corinthians 16, when I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. But I will come to you after I go through Macedonia. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Paul sets a pattern. They take up the money and they give it all to Paul. Is that what it says? What's it say? You appoint. Whomever you appoint. You, this is a great example of church autonomy, isn't it? Every congregation, they make their own decision. Now, we're going to, not long from now, see Paul have all of these traveling companions with him on his way back to Jerusalem. Well, 1 Corinthians 16 tells you exactly why he has so many traveling companions from so many different cities. Because they did exactly what Paul told them. They appoint somebody and say, here's our money to give our gift to the needy Christians in Jerusalem. You bring it. And Paul says, if it's fitting, I'll go with him. So they end up traveling with Paul, but is Paul in of the money? No. Paul, in fact, is ambassador for none of these congregations. No, no, you do it. You figure it out. That's autonomy. Right? Every congregation is independent. Paul says, look, it's your money. I'm not, I'm not touching it. I don't want to see it. 
somebody else deals with it. I'll travel with them. And in fact, you'll see that Paul, one of his, his desires to travel with them is he has a little bit of a fear of that thing that we talked about, that that money will all get to Jerusalem and the Jewish Christians won't accept it. And Paul's a little worried about that, that they won't accept it. And so he wants to, he wants to be there to help grease the skids a little bit. But uh, this, this is autonomous work by, by every single congregation. Any, any questions or comments? That, that all makes sense so far? Okay. So, from uh, Galatia and Phrygia, then he's going to head down to Ephesus. So, go back to Acts, right? And um, down in verse 19, uh, not verse 9, excuse me, Acts 19, starting in verse 1, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. So now Paul is traveling. He's traveled past that Galatian and Phrygian region. And last journey, he couldn't go into Asia and he ended up in Troas. This time he's allowed to. So he ends up in Ephesus. So in Acts chapter 19, you see him converting uh, uh, 12 different men who knew the baptism of John, but not the baptism of Jesus. And uh, then in verse 8, he goes into Ephesus, and it says he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So here's Paul. He's in Ephesus. Where's Paul teaching? He's, yeah, he's in the school of Tyrannus. He starts out in the synagogue. He's there three months, and then he moves to this school. Just be, as far as I can tell, it, it's no different than uh, if we were looking for a place to meet and we rented a, a school facility or something like that. I don't know if he rented it. Maybe he knew the guy who owned it. I don't know. Doesn't tell you any of that, but that's where he's at. So Paul stays in one spot, but where does the gospel go? He's there two years in one spot. Where does the gospel go? All of Asia. So Paul's not teaching everybody in Asia. Paul's teaching people at that school, and then they're all leaving, and they're teaching people. This, by the way, is the biblical model. If Paul is the only evangelist, this chapter does not look the same. Paul comes to Ephesus, he teaches whoever comes to him, and it just kind of stops there. And, and Paul's one guy, and so even after two years, one guy, if he's the only one doing the teaching, he's going to make an impact, but only so much. But Paul's actual impact comes through the ripple effect of it. Paul teaches people, he reasons daily, He's doing his part, but then people are converted, and then they go home, and they teach people too. This is the biblical model of evangelism. It's never been effective when you have a guy. Now, think about the modern church today. How does it run now? All about the guy, isn't it? Get your guy. Get your pastor guy. Your head pastor, make him, and he does the whole thing. You just put your money in the plate, and that makes it work. It's not biblical. That, that idea of putting all of the emphasis on one person, and Paul will address that in many of his letters, but not the least of which is 1 Corinthians. In the Corinthian letter, when they're attaching themselves to Paul or Apollos, his whole point is, you've missed the whole thing. is isn't about any of us men. We're all just servants, and you're servants too. So get out there and do the work because we all serve Christ. So... Ephesus, he's there for two years, which is the longest time period we see him at any location. We previously saw him at Corinth for a year and a half, and that was really long. This is two years. Okay, so lots of little details here. Everybody with me, or do you have any questions? Because it's going to get worse. Okay, so Paul's in Ephesus. He's teaching there for two years, and things are going gangbusters. Just great in every way. So Paul can't leave because the work is so great. Can you imagine if an entire portion of the country 
was receiving and growing because of the work you were doing. And then somebody said, hey, what do you think? You want to move? No, I got to stay right here. So that's what Paul is in. He's in that case in Ephesus. But here's the problem. While he's in Ephesus, across the pond, I'm pretty sure they didn't call it the pond, but we're going to do that. Corinth writes him a letter and says, we have some big questions. And you know that because in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul will address in his letter, he says, concerning the things that you wrote to me about. Now, the things that he, they write to him about, he's going to address in 1 Corinthians 7, and they include things like, how many wives should a man have? And how big of a deal is marriage? Now, what does that tell you? You imagine, imagine you're a preacher for a second, and there's a congregation you had started, and now they write you and they go, is it really a big deal, that marriage thing? What does your brain do? Uh-oh, right? And then they ask another question. Here's their follow-up question that he has to address. Was Jesus really raised from the dead, or was that just kind of an allegory? Is that just like one of those mythological stories like Hercules or something like that? Or, or did that actually happen? So that's their follow-up question. Is marriage important? Or, you know, can you just like divorce whenever you feel like it and do whatever you want? And we've been talking about it. We're not really sure whether Jesus raised from the dead and whether that even matters. What does that do to Paul? And remember, this is the, other than Ephesus, where has he spent the most amount of time? Corinth. So I'd flip my lid. But can he leave? No, because things are going great in Ephesus. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says there's a second thing that happens. Not only does he get this letter that would have just made me go bonkers, but a second thing that happens is he says in 1 Corinthians 1, regarding all the divisions in the church, he says, I have heard from Chloe's household, and in part I believe it. I don't know who Chloe is, and I don't know who Chloe's household are, those individuals, but they were connected to Corinth. That's what I know. And so they come, and for whatever reason, they leave Corinth, and they run into Paul, and Paul says, hey, how are those Corinthians doing? And they go, oh, man, Paul. I mean, it's, it's not good. They're over there debating who's the better preacher, you or Apollos? Well, I can kind of understand that. Or Jesus. A what? I mean, that's what they're debating right now. So if you're Paul, the, the stress level, the emotion ratchets up to 11, right? But he can't leave. Because all of Asia is hearing the word of God. So here's a man, and he'll, he'll write this way, by the way. He'll say, my heart was in over there in Corinth. And he'll tell you when he writes the first Corinthian letter, he says, I wrote it in tears. I want you to imagine they get that letter and, and here's Paul and the parts that he wrote by hand, a lot of times he dictated, but the parts he wrote by hand, there's tear stains on the letter. They get the scroll and there's these marks, you know, like you might have a coffee mug mark from me. You'd have tear stains from Paul because he cried over them. He loved them, but he couldn't go. So what he does is this. He sends Titus. And we know that because in the second letter that he'll write, he'll talk about Titus, and how Titus was the one that he, he had sent. So from Ephesus is where 1 Corinthians is written. Now, I cover all of that because the next time you cover and, and go through 1 Corinthians, I want you to do it with your heart in your hand. Because that's how Paul wrote it, with his heart in his hand. This was a man who loved these people. And he was terrified. Because what's on the line here, by the way? What's on the line if they are not sure Jesus was really raised from the dead? And they're not sure whether they're like Apollos is preaching more or Jesus is preaching. What's on the line? Their souls. It's a heaven and hell issue. This is not, well, you know, I kind of like Scott's preaching, but... You know, I've heard Ralph Walker speak, and he's better than him. I'd agree with you on that. This is who's really in charge of the church. Whose church is it? Is it Paul's church, or is it Jesus' church? It's, this is a massive issue. So Paul writes this letter, and at the same time that he writes that letter, 
he's also going to send Timothy. <clears throat> now, the next part I'm going to tell you, I can't guarantee you this is what Paul was thinking. Okay, so that's my caveat right up front. I don't know what Paul was thinking exactly. But if you put yourself in his shoes, this is what I think is a pretty likely reasoning. He sends Titus with the letter and says, Titus, you go right now and you get that letter to him and I want them to read it. You make them read it. You read it right in front of them. You make them see these words. And then you get back to me as soon as you can. You get there with that letter and you preach it to him and then you get back to me because I need to know what's going on. You go fast and then you come back. And then he gets to thinking, well, if that's going into Corinth, what about all these other churches? I mean, it, I was there a year and a half in Corinth. What about Philippi or Thessalonica or Berea, these places? I didn't spend nearly as much time. So he takes Timothy, and in Acts chapter 19, you look in Acts 19, down in verse 22. It says, and having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Now, I mentioned Timothy and not Erastus because... I'm irascible, and Timothy is the guy you're going to follow, right? Paul sends a couple of preachers ahead of him. He says, you just go visit all those churches, but when you're done visiting those churches, you know where I want you to end up, Timothy? Corinth. You preach to all of them, you check on all of them, and then you head to Corinth. So Titus is going to go right now, and then he's going to get back to me, and you're going to go check on all of them, and then you plant yourself there in Corinth, and we get this thing fixed. That's what's happening. Does that make sense? Okay, a lot of little details. But again, what we're doing is we're painting a picture of what it's like to be Paul. Paul will say things like, I've been through shipwrecks, and I've been through beatings, and I've been through all these things. And on top of that, my daily concern for all the churches. That's what we're looking at here. On top of that, my daily concern for all the churches. So, eventually, having written the first Corinthian letter from Ephesus, but he can't leave, something will happen that will let him leave. Why will Paul leave Ephesus? If you're reading through chapter 19, what is it? Something happens there. I'm going to cover it real quick. We've been covering like one or two verses and spending forever on it. Now I'm going to cover a whole chapter and spend no time. What happens in Ephesus? The riot, that's it. There's a giant riot. And Paul, they, there's a giant mob, and the whole thing is about uh, money, and you have Demetrius, and he's got this group of silversmiths and tradesmen are making idols, and they're making money, and they feel like they're losing money now because Paul and, and Christianity is spreading in Asia, and idolatry is dying, and with that, their pocketbook is getting thinner and thinner, and Nobody in the history of the world has ever mixed religion and money before, right? And so that whole thing happens, and Paul almost gets himself in trouble. The only reason he doesn't end up right where the mob is is because the Christians keep him out. So he's wanting to go in there, and the whole thing comes together, but eventually at the end of it, it's time for Paul to leave. After the Ephesian riots, Paul gets to a point where he says, uh, it, it's time to leave. And so he will, in chapter 20, in verse 1, after the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and when he exhorted them and taken his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. Now, what Paul's going to do is he's going to follow Timothy. He sent Timothy ahead, said, go check on all these churches, go through Macedonia and end up in Corinth. Well, Paul's going to do the same thing. He's going to go through all of these territories, check on all of these churches, but his goal, his end result is, where does he want to be? He wants to be at Corinth. Because Corinth is a mess, and he's terrified. And what we find out in the Corinthian letters is that Paul, he sent Titus with the letter, and then Titus was supposed to come straight back. But Paul, as he leaves Ephesus, guess who hasn't come back yet? No Titus. No return yet. So if you're Paul, and you just told him, get that letter there and get back as soon as possible, but now it's been months and he hasn't shown up, what are you thinking? It's real bad, right? Maybe he's the one who got stoned. Maybe he's dead. Maybe, maybe it's 
I mean, who knows, right? This is the problem with uh, living in a world that we can't imagine where dissemination of information doesn't happen fast. You're left wondering. You know, this is part of our problem, I think, sometimes. Quick side rant. We have a problem not knowing things. Because if you don't know something, you're sitting at a dinner table. You go, who was the 23rd president? Nobody at the table knows. What happened? Google knows? That's right. Somebody pulls out their phone and Google knows. Right? Tonight we were just at a dinner table we're talking about what time is sunset and like when the summer solstice hits, what, how, what's the latest it gets in Louisville? I don't know that information, but Google does. And so we just get it immediately, right? We're just immediately fed information. And so when we're told to rely on God and we're told, look, God knows things you don't know. And you're going to just have to trust the plan. We have not flexed that muscle. We are, you know, you, you don't use the muscle of not, the not knowing muscle. That's a, that's a muscle you have to use to get stronger with, the, the not knowing. And, and so we don't, we're not in the habit of that. They absolutely were in the habit of that. And so uh, Paul uh, heads up uh, and follows behind where Timothy is. And the, the scriptures say that in, in Macedonia, he found Titus. Now, for whatever reason, Titus comes back through Macedonia and, and goes that way instead of over the water. We don't know why, never tells us, and it doesn't really matter. But at that point, Paul finds Titus and asks Titus when he finds him, how are things in Corinth? How are things in Corinth? And Titus gives him the best news. He says, they heard you, Paul, and they are changing. And they obeyed, and they have repented, and they had godly sorrow, and they are doing exactly what you wanted them to do. And so Paul sits down in Macedonia, and so right there, right about, if you're marking it in your Bible, Acts chapter 20, about verse 2, is when he writes 2 Corinthians, the second letter. Now, from a preacher's standpoint, I don't like 2 Corinthians. And here's why. Because when I am looking at a book of the Bible, I like to outline it. Because then I can put a slide up and says, chapter one is about this, chapter two is about this, chapter three is about this. And you go, well, Scott really knows what he's talking about. Like, look at that. That's great. That's a real nice slide. Second Corinthians, you cannot do that. You cannot do that with Second Corinthians. Because it is such an emotional letter. And it is... It is like, have you ever lost your kid in a store? And I mean not like for half an aisle. I mean enough for you to kind of get that feeling. And so then all of a sudden you find your kid. And you find your kid wandering around over in the candy section or talking to some stranger or whatever it is. And, and everything's okay. So you grab your kid. Yeah, see, some of you are having some moments right now. You're thinking about it. You've, you've had that moment, and it was terrifying. All the moms are having that. The dads are like, what? Uh, I don't know. Um, but with that, Paul is going to say, he's going to write that 2 Corinthian letter, and just like finding that kid, he's going to be like, oh, man, I am so thankful. I'm so thankful. Don't you ever do that to me again. And he's going to go back and forth between those emotions. And that's the second Corinthian letter. That's where we're going to stop. I know we're at time. Thank you all for your patience with me today.